Let's talk radiation-laced weaponry, mysterious tech priest rituals, and phalanxes of pre-programmed bionic warriors marching into battle with a look at the Adeptus Mechanicus in 40k 10th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Adeptus Mechanicus and an overview of the army in Warhammer 40k 10th. In this video we'll do a focused look at all the index rules for the faction, the core rules for the army, stratagems and enhancements, and look through all the data sheets. Currently in the early days of 10th edition, I'd say that Admech are one of the armies that Games Workshop just hasn't really done very well to get balanced yet. Quite a lot of their units are a little bit underwhelming for their points costs, and early tournament results maybe aren't doing so great. Probably could use a bit of a shot in the arm when it comes to the next balance update, which hopefully won't be too long away. But until then, there's still a fair few things that work pretty well within the index, so I thought that it would be good to take a look over all their options and what works and what doesn't. Looking at the contents of Index Adeptus Mechanicus, we've got the Doctrina Imperatives Faction Rule, giving your ranged weapons either Assault or Heavy keywords, plus some benefits and debuffs to AP. Their launch detachment is the Rad Cohort. This one's definitely a lot more out there compared with a whole bunch of the detachments in Warhammer 40k, an army themed around a big radiation bombardment into enemy lines early in the game. They've got 6 stratagems to back that up, and 4 enhancements as well, and then a set of 29 data sheets, basically the entire plastic line of the army, the Forge World units have now unfortunately gone to Legends, so the Terax, Termite Trail and the Titan Guard units, they're no longer recommended for competitive play. Let's talk through each of those sections in turn, and how powerful the rules are in-game. First up, let's start with the overall faction rule for the Adeptus Mechanicus. This is the one that should be set going forward, and every Admech army will gain access to this regardless of detachment when their codex comes out, which is supposedly in winter time. This one replaces the slightly complex 9th edition rules, where you had just four different Doctrinas to select over the course of the game, that plus the system of canticles for Court Mechanicus units as well. This one's maybe a bit more of a feel-good rule, as it's got all positive effects, you don't have to make any trade-offs between debuffing half your units at the same time. The idea is that generally at the start of each battle round you get to select either the Protector or Conqueror Imperative, and then all units in your army with the relevant special rule gain these benefits for ranged attacks. Unlike some other faction rules in Warhammer 40k, Doctrina Imperatives isn't just gained by literally the entire army, like say the Space Marine Oath of Moment, this one's a bit more fluff locks to the units that are a bit more pre-programmed by the Tech Priests, so things like the Skitari get it, plus things like the Catafrom Battle Servitors, but it seems that the actual tech priests and electro priests don't get that, and the Castellan robots don't either. Perhaps just a little bit frustrating to have a few of the Admex limited unit pool locked out of their main faction rule perhaps. You choose the rule at the start of the battle round, which could be helpful sometimes as opposed to having to choose it in the command phase. Could be helpful on the first turn in particular, if you're entirely within your own deployment zone and the enemy is going first, that means that you could choose the defensive one and make their attacks a little bit less potent and you wouldn't be able to if it was just in your command phase that you had to declare it. Finally I'd note that they're all really quite ranged focus, perhaps not too surprising as he is Admex generally an army that's more about guns and shooting as opposed to close combat and fighting in melee, but it does mean that even within the units that it affects, there are some units that just won't really care too much about the Doctrina Imperatives. Say for example the Ross Stalkers don't really care too much about it, nor do the Dragoons armed with Taser Lancers. As for the actual choice that you've got, you choose between Protector and Conqueror. Both of these have a Weapon Keyword part and a Deployment Zone AP part. For the Protector one, you get the Heavy Keyword on all your ranged weapons, so if your units choose to remain stationary, then they get to hit on a 3+. Most of the Admech army has now dropped from hitting on a 3+, to a 4+, now. In addition, if you have units within your own Deployment Zone, you get to worsen the enemy AP by 1 if they're attacking your units there. Both of those are pretty good, a lot of the time though you will just need to move to get lines of sight or range on the enemy, so it's not always going to be super relevant, but if you've got a turn when a lot of your units can afford to just stay still, stand and shoot, Protector seems good. The Deployment Zone AP thing could be kind of nice as well, a few units do have some fairly high saves, Catafrons have a 3+, plus and could easily get cover, and the Onager and the Scorpius tank, they both have a 2+, plus save, and are also fairly easy to get cover with 10th edition rules now. Protector could make them quite resilient against higher AP anti-tank guns. Otherwise, the option is Conqueror. You get the Assault keyword on all your ranged weapons army-wide, so unless you're charging in with everything, then you may as well advance and shoot the guns. If you do have a fairly ranged army, this is a lot of extra mobility, an extra D6 inch movement for literally every unit that you have. That's going to be quite a big deal for getting to objectives, getting in range or getting line of sight on the enemy, and it's quite nice. And on top of that, if the target of your attacks happens to be within your opponent's deployment zone, then you get to improve the AP of that attack by minus 1. 
I guess between this and the VAD bombardment that we'll get onto to a second, there's a fair chance the opponent might want to get a few of their units out of their deployment zone to counter them a bit, but I feel like both parts to Conqueror are really quite handy. Between the two, maybe Protector seems like perhaps one of the best ones to go for if your opponent's going first and they are going to get a bunch of damage on your units in your deployment zone. Could be really quite good to worsen their AP there. Otherwise, I think it's just going to be a bit of a decision turn on turn that you have to make. Is it going to be best to have the movement and extra damage output against enemy deployment zone units? Or can you afford to stand still and have the units in your own drop zone be a little bit tougher? Both of them could be good, and for the units it's relevant for, I think it's quite a nice rule. Moving on though, let's talk about the Admate Launch Detachment. This one is the Rad Cohort, and I must admit the Rad Bombardment special rule for this one is kind of strange, I think. Quite a lot of other detachments in 40k tend to have some slightly more generalist rules, whereas what they went for for Admech is sort of simulating a pre-game artillery bombardment that then chips away at units in the enemy deployment zone for the rest of the game. I must admit I'm not the biggest fan of this rule, I think it's not really all that impactful with the way that Battleshock works. First up, the way that it works at the start of the first battle round is that each enemy unit in their deployment zone needs to either stand firm or take cover, the opponent gets to choose. If they stand firm, they take D3 mortal wounds on a roll of a 3+, which is quite nice damage output if they all choose to do that, but otherwise they can choose to take cover. The unit gets automatically battle shocked, but doesn't take any damage whatsoever. Both of those are kind of annoying things to the opponent, though I feel like most of the time they're probably going to want to take the battle shock on most units. Primary objectives aren't scored in battle round 1, so it's not going to be as useful for that. I suppose it could be helpful enough for a couple of secondary objectives that revolve around having objectives but I guess you could always leave one or two units to have the risk of taking the damage and still be able to capture the points that you absolutely need to. It could prevent a bunch of units using stratagems on the first turn, which could be kind of handy, I guess. And I suppose theoretically the fallback rule could come into play if you manage to charge the enemy with some fast movers, maybe have some Cerberus Raiders or some Sakaran Infiltrators going for an early game charge, and then the opponent might have a tricky decision to make whether or not to risk desperate breakouts. In theory, at least, it could give the opponent a slightly more shaky start to the game, but if they're playing at least somewhat cagey or happy not to spend too many stratagems in the first turn and save them up for round two maybe when the armies are a bit more engaged, it just might not wind up being the most impactful thing. Then on turns two plus, it basically becomes a chance to deal some damage to enemy units. Each enemy unit in their deployment zone needs to roll a dice and on a three plus they suffer one mortal wound. So I guess in theory over the rest of the game, if they did keep units entirely within their deployment zone, you'd have to round about two or three mortal wounds on them by the game's end. Definitely not unhelpful, but I guess you'd be unlikely to be wiping squads out with that, never mind if they had any feel no pain type saves, or they did choose to leave their deployment zone towards the end of the game maybe. It would certainly be a lot less impactful as well if the opponent was just playing a fairly aggressive army, happy to move everything up to try and bring the fight to the admech, could mean that the rule just has very low impact indeed I suppose. Overall I think it's a bit disruptive but perhaps not the hardest thing in the world to manage for most opponents. For the round one thing, they're going to always have the option of choosing the best option for them, whether it's taking D3 mortal wounds or taking battle shock, whichever suits them better. Otherwise though, for support for the detachment, there's a whole bunch of stratagems, often based around radiation and bombarding the enemy. For one command point, there's Baleful Halo. This one's quite a nice defensive boost, with a minus one to wound for one of your non-vehicle units in the fight phase, that seems like it could be quite good for Catafron Servitors maybe. A fairly good debuff to enemies that thought they might be able to wipe out a unit fairly easily, particularly if they were wounding on either 4s or 5s. For one command point, there's Extinction Order. This one is where one of your Tet Priests basically targets an objective. For every enemy unit within range of that objective, on a 4+, plus, they take a Mortal Wound, and also have to take a Battle Shock test. In general, I'd rate this one as really quite weak, it's never really going to be worth it for the damage output unless there happened to be a unit that just had, say, one wound left on an objective and the rest of your army couldn't see it. I guess theoretically the best way of using it could be to try and flip an objective to your control. It happens in your command phase after all. But then to do that, you both need to roll the 4 plus for the unit that you need to have fail and also have them actually fail the battle talk test as well, which odds are they're going to pass anyway. Seems like a bit of an underwhelming one to be honest. Can't see this one being used all that often. Next up, for two command points, we've got Lethal Dosage. This one's good but also expensive, plus one to wound when you're shooting at an enemy unit. A bit on the pricey side as it's two command points, but a lot of Admech's best damage dealers are ranged ones. You would probably want to use this on something fairly big and valuable though, maybe a big mass unit of Cataphrons, or perhaps something like a Scorpius Disintegrator as a push. It's a shame that this one doesn't have any effect against enemy vehicles, which are perhaps the biggest target that you'd really want to use them against. 
I suppose it could be handy for the armies that have big tough monsters like Tyranids though, and it's just some fairly reliable extra damage outputs to a key unit when you need it. Next for one command point there's Aggressor Imperative, this one gives you advance and charge for one Skitari unit, but only if the Conqueror Doctrina is active. I guess for units that you'd actually want to advance and charge that are Skitari, it'd probably be either the Rust Stalkers or the Sindonian Dragoons. I guess maybe the Cerberus units like the Sulphur Hounds as a push as well, they could be good with some Mortal Wound Impact hits. Advance and charge really is quite nice, it could make those units go really quite quickly, perhaps particularly the Rust Stalkers who have bonuses to both. Though I feel like between the limited units that you'd want to use it on, plus having to be in the right Doctrina, it might make it just a tiny bit more niche. If it's the difference between getting powerful melee into combat or not though, it could be worth it, and even it could be a good reason to choose the Conqueror Doctrina in the first place. Next we've got Vengeful Fallout for 1 CP. This one is essentially a return fire stratagem against an enemy unit that just shot you. And I think that this one's really quite a nice one for just one command point. Getting an entire shooting phase out of a unit for 1 CP is generally well worth it. Perhaps particularly so if the unit that shot you is also going to be one that went on to charge. I guess the dream would be to kill a significant amount of a charging unit with return fire. And both get the enemy models dead as well as save yourself a bunch of damage later in the turn. As with most of these, better on bigger shooting units. Again, Cataphrons or Ferromite Scorpius seem quite good. Finally, for one command point, we've got Bulwark Imperative. This one's a nice reactive 4 plus invulnerable save for Skitari units only. This one's one that you can only use when the Protector Doctrina is active. It's really quite a nice defensive buff if you can go for it. Perhaps best on things just like the standard Skitari troops that only have a 6 plus invulnerable save normally, or maybe some of the vehicles like the Archaeopters or the Scorpius tanks. They don't have an invulnerable save at all, so going to a 4 plus could be quite good there. Generally, I think that's usable enough though, if you think it is going to make the difference between your opponent expending more fire or even the unit surviving or dying. Overall, I'd say that the Admex stratagems really aren't too bad. For reliable value, I think that the Bulwark one and the Advance and Charge ones are both really good depending on which Doctrina you're in. Vengeful Fallout to get an entire shooting phase for a unit for one command point is situationally great. And the plus one to wound shooting or minus one to wound in melee both seem handy enough. The plus one to wound being quite expensive though, and the minus one to wound kind of depending on what's attacking you in combat and whether it might actually save you. I do feel like as the codex stands though, quite a lot of these things are just best on things like the Cataphron Servitors if you can use them on. Really quite big, chunky and dangerous units make great use of these stratagems. Moving on, we've got the Rad Cohort Enhancements and there's four of them. For just 10 points, there's Archived Purge Protocols, this one allows you to swap Doctrinas for one Skitari unit within 12 inches. So say you could have most of your army in the Protector Doctrina, but just one unit in Conqueror if you really wanted the advanced movement or the extra AP. I think for 10 points that's really quite a nice one to have somewhere in the midst of your army. It might not always matter hugely, but I feel like just to have the flexibility with your core rule, that seems like really quite a good deal. The next one I think is quite nice as well. Excoriating Emanation is 25 points. This one grants stealth to the unit that you're leading. A minus one to hit is pretty useful on just about everything. And as mentioned with the other stratagems and things, better on the big cataphron blocks. Makes them even better things to have on the battle line as they're going to be even tougher as well as meeting out some good damage. Next up we've got Master Annihilator which is 35 points. This one gives you sustained hits 1 for your ranged weapons. 35 points is really quite a lot to pay, and I think that is going to be a bit too expensive for things like your regular Skitari troops, now they only come in squads of 10. Sustained hits 1 is pretty good when you're hitting on 4s to start with, often going to be a 33% damage boost there. I think at 35 points that is good enough to justify the extra cost, if you can get a couple of rounds worth of shooting out of it. Finally for 20 points we've got the Omni Steriliser. This one's a personal ranged buff to your tech priest, and it gives you an extra 3 attacks to the characteristic of your ranged weapons, and also gives them both anti-infantry 2+, plus and anti-monster 4+. plus. For a ranged shooting buff, this is actually surprisingly potent, I think. Really could be quite nice with, say, a tech priest manipulous with the Magna Rail Lance. That's just supposed to be one shot with strength 7 and damage 3, so making that into 4 attacks is really quite a big upgrade. I suppose it could be quite good with a tech priest dominus Volkite weapon as well. The Volkite Blaster gets devastating wounds, so making that into 6 attacks and getting 2 mortal wounds on every 2 plus versus infantry seems kind of big. Overall, I feel like the enhancements for the Admech are actually genuinely quite good. I think literally all of them are usable. Maybe the Stealth and Master Annihilator perhaps have the biggest scope for changing the game. Fairly powerful buffs that can be put on one of the strongest units in the Index, but Doctrina Manipulation is very good, and the Omni Steriliser makes a Tech Priest shooting downright scary, compared with just being kind of okay. 
Overall, I'd say that the supporting options for the Rad cohort aren't too bad. A bunch of usable stratagems and the enhancements seem decent enough. Perhaps the bombardment rule is the biggest question mark. Against a couple of armies, it could be somewhat disruptive. Against some armies and some matchups, I think it's going to do almost nothing. Moving on though, let's talk through the cohorts of Adeptus Mechanicus datasheets. Broadly speaking, no enormous changes to the lineup here. As mentioned, we have lost the Forge World Titan Guard and Terax Drill, which have gone to Legends. Still playable in match play games, but are going to be left out of balance passes and things. Otherwise, things are largely very similar. As per in 9th edition, Dezalosus has been replaced by the generic Technoca Archaeologist datasheets, but the majority of the rest of the army are just mainline plastic kits that didn't really need to be updated too much. For battle line units in the army, it's just the Skitari Rangers and the Skitari Vanguard now. The Catatron Servitors, despite being troops in the previous edition, aren't battle line anymore. They can still take really quite a hefty amount of them, given that the Breachers come in units of up to 300 points. You can take around about half your army just in Breachers alone, never mind adding the Destroyers in. It is kind of interesting that out of the Skitari ranks as well, quite a lot of the other Skitari units get some buffs to their innate abilities by being in close proximity to a battle line unit within your army. It means that including at least some Rangers and Vanguard is quite incentivized to make a lot of your units just perform a little bit better, perhaps in particular the cash from Breachers. Otherwise, for more common data sheet changes throughout the army, a lot of things hit on a 4 plus now rather than a 3 plus. That's quite a big nerf to a shooting army, and it means that if you want to hit on a 3 plus, you'd have to be in Protector Doctrine and stay still. It does mean that a lot of the firepower is a bit more vulnerable to modifiers, say enemy units with stealth. The Adeptus Mechanicus still have their Bionics in fairly good representation. The majority of Amec units get a 5 plus invulnerable save but the Skitari troops get a 6+, plus, as do the Catafrons. And as before, the vehicles that are tanks and flyers, they don't get any invulnerable saves at all. Finally, the army is generally leadership 7, makes them more vulnerable to battle shock than some of the higher leadership armies out there, things like Space Marines. Sometimes it can be more relevant than others, but it does mean that it could be a potential weakness if your units get depleted. In any case, let's jump into the Admech roster, and starting out we've got the Skitari Rangers, 10 models for 125 points, and generally considered to be fairly overcosted with where a lot of people might like them to be. Both the Skitari Rangers and the Vanguard used to be able to be taken in squads between 10 and 20 during 9th edition, when we had Horde Admeg in big representation, but in really quite a tone down to their power you can only take units of 10 of them now, which makes them far less interesting for say leader characters to join the unit, or any expensive stratagems to make their damage or defence better. Overall means they're likely to shift to be a bit more of a hold the line type thing and empower your other units, as opposed to being some of the core damage and defence units in your whole army. The base Guitari profile seems to have got a bit of a nerf on the durability front. A toughness 3 and only a 5 plus save with a 6 plus invulnerable save now, really quite a steep decline compared with the 4 plus and 5 plus that they had towards the end of 9th edition. For around about 12 points per model, that's really quite underwhelming I think, they are quite easy to kill these days. Otherwise, they get a 6-inch scout move, so the rangers can move up to take mid-board positions if they want to, and could do that inside a dune rider if they'd like, and they do have objective control too when they get two points, so can provide a little bit more weight on objectives than most of the rest of the roster. When they're shooting, as mentioned, they're hitting on a 4+, plus now, not a 3, and their galvanic rifles are now 30 inches, two shots at strength 4, AP 0, and damage 1. A decent enough small arms against enemy light infantry at range, but are going to struggle to crack things in power armour or anything tougher. With 10th edition's free war gear handout, you get one of each of the special weapons in the squad. They all get one plasma caliber, one transuranic arquebus, and one arc rifle, all three of which at least have some fairly nice general purpose profiles, mid strength, multi damage, and a bit of AP on them, generally fairly helpful for boosting you taking out some heavy infantry. They'll generally ignore cover as well with their Omnispecs, and I guess that's handy enough in 10th edition where cover saves are really quite easy to get for most enemies. They've got the option to trade out the Omnispecs for a data tether for a small chance to farm some command points, but I think that in general ignores cover all game long is probably going to beat that out. And then finally their special rule is that they get to get objective secured. A sticky objectives type rule which means that if you hold it in your command phase, then even if you move off it or the unit gets shot dead, the objective remains yours until the opponent can actually take it themselves. Overall, I feel like this certainly could be a very interesting troops unit, but they probably just cost a bit too much at the moment. 125 points does seem like a big tax for these guys given their damage and particularly their low defence. I have seen a few competitive lists using at least one unit of them though, maybe to trigger buffs for things like cash from breaches, and also having some guns that can actually contribute at longer range compared with the Vanguard. 
Kind of a shame not to have big blocks of these marching forward anymore though. It means that a lot of buffs and leaders and things are maybe just a touch more underwhelming for them. Otherwise, their counterparts are the Skitari Vanguard. 10 models just for 100 points, so massively cheaper than the Rangers. They don't get Scout, but their base stats are kind of the same. And they have the same special weapons, but swap out the Galvanic Rifles for the Radium Carbine. The Radium Carbines get 3 shots, hitting on a 4+, Strength 3, AP 0 and Damage 1, and the Anti-Infantry keyword, so they'll be wounding everything on a 4+, there. They no longer auto-wound on a certain amount to hit anymore, but they could theoretically pick up lethal hits from a Manipulus if you have one in the unit. Their weapons also don't have the Assault keyword innately anymore, unless they're in the Conqueror Imperative. I think that's a bit of an issue for them if they're going to be skirmishing with enemy infantry, means they might struggle to get in range a bit more than before. Finally, their rad saturation is now a minus one objective control within three inches. That does mean that if a unit of these is on an objective, then they're going to be abnormally hard to take that point away from them, which I think is kind of nice as that's usually where you'd want them. It is a bit sad not having the strength and toughness debuff anymore though. That was kind of nice for fighting against pure toughness three infantry, where they could often get the edge over them just literally with that debuff alone. Overall, I'd rate them a bit more efficient than the Skitari Rangers, quite a lot cheaper for the bodies, and can put in some work against light infantry with some spammed anti-infantry shots. Moving on, let's talk about the Catafron Servitors next, and perhaps one of the strongest units in the entire Admec Index is the Catafron Breachers, 150 points for 3 of them, or 300 for 6 of them. These guys have got fairly big chunky stat lines, toughness 7, a 3 plus save, and 3 wounds, and now they've got the infantry keyword rather than having mounted anymore, so they interact with terrain just completely as normal. Weapons wise, these guys can put out some of the best firepower in the codex right now. Out of the two, I think that the heavy arc rifle is probably the stronger and more general purpose. Two shots to 36 inches, at strength 8, AP minus 2 and damage 3, with anti-vehicle 4 plus, and rapid fire 2 as well, so potentially 4 shots within 18 inch range. That's really quite nice general purpose shooting, should be pretty savage both against medium and heavy infantry, plus against vehicles too. I think it probably beats out the torsion cannon with D3 shots and blast and anti-infantry out to 48 inch range. It will beat out the rail rifle against any really massed up squads with like 28 models in them or something. But I feel like the arc rifle is probably the way to go. He's still going to be wounding infantry on a 2 plus or 3 plus, so they're still very efficient. And he can still get 4 shots out of that, but you just need to get a bit closer. Then in combat, they have the option to trade between either an arc claw with anti-vehicle and a bunch of anti-light infantry attacks, or the hydraulic claw, which is perhaps a bit better against skirmishing with enemy elites, strength 8, AP 2 and damage 3, could at least threaten terminators. Both of those seem handy enough, and might be a bit more tempted by the hydraulic ones overall. Finally though, their special rule is really quite a good one. Each time the model in the unit makes an attack, re-roll the hit roll of 1, or fully re-roll the hit roll if there's a battle line unit within 6 inches. That means that provided you've got some Skitari troops somewhat nearby, it means that you should be hitting with 3 out of every 4 of these shots, making them into a very efficient general purpose firepower unit. Seems that at the moment, that running a few big blocks of breaches seems to be one of the strongest ways to play Admech right now. Otherwise, their alternative is the Catafron Destroyers, a bit cheaper at 120 points or 240. Their stats are kind of similar to the Breachers, with Toughness 6 rather than Toughness 7. And while they don't get the big re-rolls for being near battle line units, they get to two overwatch on a 5+, plus, which I guess could be handy enough, particularly as they usually hit on a 4+, plus anyway, so they're not really losing all that much. These guys get the choices between the Heavy Grav Cannon or the Plasma Culverin. I think both of them are actually fairly well balanced. The Grav's got a profile that's quite good at killing infantry anyway, and if it does target a vehicle, then they get to wound on a 2+, plus, which is pretty big. You could maybe get them in range with Strategic Reserve as well if you fancied. The plasma is just really quite general purpose with 4 shots at strength 8, AP 3 and damage 2. Very very good at killing elite infantry like space marines, but if you overcharge it they do have a chance of killing themselves with hazardous rolls. With a unit of 6 you'd average 1 dead per turn. Overall I think that these guys are still usable, could spam some more profiles that are similar to the breaches, and both of their guns feel fairly good. Moving on, let's talk through the other Adeptus Mechanicus squads. And starting out we've got the Sicarian Infiltrators. These are the forward deploy ones, and they're 80 points for 5 of them, or 160. They start in the midfield with infiltrators, and have stealth for a little bit more durability against enemy shooting. They've got toughness 4, 2 wounds with a 4 plus save, and a 5 plus invulnerable. Not terrible durability, and your opponent would need at least some focus fire to put them down, but they're still not outstanding for 16 points each effectively. For their weapons, you have the choice between the flechette blaster and the stub carbine. I think both of those are kind of well balanced with either getting more shots or strength 4. 
I'd say the Flechette Blaster wins out very slightly at range, and then they combine that either with Taser Goads or with Power Weapons, only getting two attacks with these though, either with a bit of AP and Strength 4 with a Power Weapon, or Sustained Hits 2 and Strength 6 with the Taser Goad, but no AP at all. I think between the two I'd probably lean towards the Taser Goad over the Power Weapon, that's the one that comes with the Flechette Blaster. In general though, they're not really going to do all that much besides skirmishing against light infantry, which they can do quite well at. I feel like you are paying a bit of a premium here to have a unit start in the midfield, and their damage output really does suffer for that. Their special rule is a Battleshock debuff, minus 1 to leadership within 6 inches of them, or minus 2 if they happen to be next to a battle line unit, though I feel like often they're not going to be, given that they're starting in the midfield. Overall, I don't really think they're all that exciting for their damage output, but it could be okay to scream back the enemy, and just have a disruptive threat start off far forward. Against the right enemy army as well, their damage output could be okay against light infantry. Maybe more expensive ones, things like Eldar Aspect Warriors, or maybe some Gene Steel Occultists, perhaps. The Rust Stalkers are a little bit cheaper than the Infiltrators. The same profile, but at 75 points or 150. They get stealth as well for a minus one to hit at range, but they don't get infiltrate to forward deploy. They have two way up between the transionic blades and the razors and cord claws, basically choosing between a pair of different buffs, either getting anti-infantry 3 plus and AP minus 2 on their attacks, or getting four attacks with devastating wounds. The Rust Stalker Princeps gets the best of both worlds. He can be really quite savage in melee with four attacks with both anti-infantry and devastating wounds, so that could be a few mortal wounds handed out there. All their attacks get precision, so they could be alright for taking down some characters if there's a weak supporting one in a unit, though I guess ideally if you're charging them into something, you probably want to be just trying to wipe out the enemy squad as much as possible anyway. Their special rule is they get to add plus 1 to their advance and charge, or plus 2 if they started within 6 inch range of an Adeptus Mechanicus battle line unit. The plus 2 does mean that they could be going really quite quickly across the board. They seem like the unit that you'd most want to use that advance and charge stratagem on. If they could coordinate that with a battle line unit, you could have an average charge of over 20 inches with these guys. Really quite a long threat range, but perhaps their damage output not quite as exciting as it might have used to be. Even a big unit might kind of struggle to make its presence felt against enemy elites like Terminators maybe. It does feel a bit unfortunate that they can't be led by characters as well. I feel like having a hidden character in there for a bit more melee and some other buffs could be useful for them. Next up, we've got the Bat-Winged Da Vinci Admech of the Taraxi. The Sky Stalkers are 70 points or 140. Again, they get a very similar profile to the Sicarians. Toughness 4, 4 plus save, and 2 wounds with a 5 plus invulnerable. So they lose stealth and get a 12 inch movement with fly and deep strike. For the cost, I think that that's at least a fairly durable profile there. And maybe aren't too bad as a cheap and at least fairly tough harassment unit for jumping around doing objectives and things. They spit out a whole bunch of strength 3 shooting with their flechette carbines. 6 attacks at strength 3. And they've got some quite nice powers to skirmish with the enemy, getting to move after they shoot an extra 6 inches, so they could potentially pop out, do some shooting, and move a little bit further behind terrain, or get into a table quarter or something to do a secondary objective. Their damage output isn't really all that exciting, so they're probably not a unit that you really want to take too many of, but maybe one unit for utility and secondary objective type things could be handy. And move shoot move is really quite annoying for the opponent to deal with. They also have one of those rules where they get better next to battle line units, allowing them to move 12 inches if they finish wholly within 6 inches of the battle line unit of their choice. I guess you could have some vanguard moving around, they jump up really quite far, and then get to move really quite far back to rejoin the cohort. The alternative to them with the phosphor torches are the Taraxi sterilizers, 75 points for 5 of those, 150 points for 10. The Phosphor Torches ignore cover but don't have any AP anymore, though I guess some mass flame weapons are kind of interesting in 10th edition where they've got the potential for overwatch and barbecuing some enemy hordes in their own turn. They're a bit less exciting with melee than they used to be though, they no longer have that option to try and lock units in combat, and their combat attacks don't get any AP as well, they just have strength 4 compared with the Taraxi Skystalkers strength 3. Their special rule is to attempt to debuff enemy units that they hit with their flamethrowers, you select one unit that isn't a monster or vehicle, and on a 4 plus, or automatically, if they're next to a battle line unit, that enemy unit gets minus 2 to their move, advance, and charge. I guess that could be useful if you're using these guys sacrificially, move them up to skirmish on an objective or move block or something, and then hold back the enemy unit even more. That could be kind of disruptive, though I feel like it's going to be not very consistent with them getting out of harm's way. Even with the minus 2 to move, advance and charge, the enemy is still going to have a decent chance of just charging you anyway, unless you're absolutely at the maximum of 12 inches away, I guess. I think they're still interesting enough little anti-infantry skirmishers. 
perhaps a bit more direct damage and overwatch potential compared with the Sky Stalkers, though a bit less mobility and staying safe given no jump shoot jump shenanigans. Again, could be handy enough for utility, but probably not one to go too heavy on. Next up, we've got the Cerberus Raiders, three to six models in the unit for 75 points or 150 for six. Again, these guys have that same very similar stat line to the other two. Two wounds, a 4 plus save, toughness 4 and a 5 plus invulnerable. Per point though, these guys are really quite a lot less tough compared with the other options, as you're only getting 3 of them in a squad compared with 5. They move 12 inches, get the mounted keyword and have objective control too. And perhaps again, they're paying for a bit of a premium for mid-board threat. They get to scout move 9 inches up, so they could be a unit to move and move block the enemy unit and try and pin them in their deployment zone a bit. For their attacks, they strike with galvanic carbines. Three attacks, hitting on a 4, a strength 4, AP 0 and damage 1, but they do have devastating wounds which is pretty nice. Unfortunately no precision on this incarnation of them though, so they're not going to be an anti-character force anymore, I suppose that's rust stalkers a bit more now. They can also bully light infantry a little bit in combat as well, four attacks with their cavalry sabers, a strength 4, AP 0 and damage 1. Their special rule is Tatka Oblika. This is the one where they get to make a reactive move to enemies moving nearby them. They move within 9 inches and then they get to move d6 inches in a direction of their choice. Or again, a little bit more flexibility. If they can end near a battle line unit, they get to move a full 6 there. Certainly could be enough to prevent a charge or something. Reactive movement units can be a bit trickier for the opponent to have to deal with. Next for the other flavour of dog horses, we've got the Cerberus Sulphur Hounds. These ones are a bit cheaper than the Raiders, but don't come with a scout move. 3-6 to six models at either 65 points for 3 of them, or 130 for 6. Again, perhaps not super tough per point, at least not compared with things like the Sicarians or the Taraxi. These guys are yet another unit that seems to be quite good at killing enemy infantry up close. I feel like within the Admech Elites, this really is quite a bit of an oversaturated niche. Lots of units that can handle enemy light infantry quite well and have various extra tricks, but might struggle against heavies or bigger infantry with 2 plus saves. These guys get a fair amount of shots up close though. Each guy gets the sulfur breath of his dog horse with d6 attacks at 9 inches, strength 3 and AP minus 1, plus a mix of twin links phosphor pistols or the phosphor blast carbine 1 per 3. A unit of 3 of them kills around about 7 termagants, which I think is fair enough for their cost, but anything with good armor saves and slightly higher toughness really is going to cut that down a whole load. When they charge into combat, they get some mortal wound impact hits as well with their line breaker special rule. I think this is actually kind of interesting, as they get a 4 plus to deal a mortal wound for each one charging in. With a unit of 6 of them, that's to be 3 mortal wounds on average. Not super standout, but perhaps not terrible for a unit for 130 points, and then back that up with a whole bunch of attacks, hitting on a 4 plus at strength 4 again. If they can manage to coordinate with an Admech battle line unit somehow, you could have that average go up to 5 mortal wounds, which is looking like a bit more threatening and could overwhelm mid-tier squads. I do think they might be hard to deliver into threat range though, given that they're cavalry and have to move around terrain and things, plus their defence just isn't really all that good. Next up, and for 65 points for 5 of them, or 130 for 10, we've got the Corpus Gavi Electro Priests. 13 points per model effectively, and they have very similar damage output both at range and in melee with their electrostatic gauntlets, stacking a whole bunch of strength 5 and AP 0 attacks on the enemy. Again, something that's going to threaten light and medium infantry a lot more than heavy stuff or vehicles. Admittedly, if they do get the Alpha Strike on an enemy infantry unit, they can cause a fair bit of carnage. A unit of 10 of them just at shooting averages around 30 hits at strength 5 AP 0 on the target, and is going to stack a whole bunch of saves. It equates to around about 3 dead Space Marines, 13 dead Tyranid Termagants, or 2 or 3 wounds to a Space Marine Terminator. They could also potentially follow it up with a charge as well. Might be nice enough jumping out of a Dune Rider, either before or after it's moved. They're a unit that again is at least fairly fragile to enemy counter-attacks. A 5 plus invulnerable save and a 5 plus feel no pain, but that's still not going to stop them getting mowed down by anti-light infantry shooting. Toughness 3 and a bad save is pretty nasty, and multi-damage attacks will negate that feel no pain pretty nicely as well. If they're led by a character, they do get a minus 1 to wound, which would help a bit, but I'm still not sure that gets them to the point of actually being particularly durable still. Characters tend to cost a fair bit and don't really have much raw durability of themselves. Still though, seem usable enough for some dedicated anti-horde, either being a counter-attack unit or jumping out of a dune rider. Could be kind of fun for Overwatch too, sustained hits too makes them a lot more useful for that. Next up, we've got their brothers, the Fulgurite Electro Priests. These are 80 points for 5 of them, or 160 for 10, so really quite a lot more expensive. Perhaps even more in need of something like a Dune Rider to get them close to the enemy. And when they get there, they attack with their Electro Leech staves. 
2 attacks hitting on 3s, strength 6, AP 1 and flat damage 2 with devastating wounds. It is quite a nice generalist profile, a unit of 10 of them averages around about 5 or 6 dead space marines, around 3 dead terminators with those mortal wounds, or around about 4 or 5 wounds to a toughness 12 vehicle. Against the right target should they get the charge they will cause a fair bit of carnage, but again, I think for how fragile they are and how easy they'll be to remove in return, it's still maybe just not quite devastating enough. You would again probably need to dedicate something like a Dune Rider to get them into combat, and that would mean it would be a fairly pricey unit at like 240 points if you wanted 10 in a Dune Rider. Definitely not unusable though, if you could find a way to get them to have multiple rounds of combat over the course of the game, then they'd probably be worth their points. Lastly, for the infantry units in the army, we have these standard issue servitors, Four models for 50 points. I think Games Workshop just trying to softly make these a bit of a bad choice just to have random tiny units around capping objectives and things. Though I did find it kind of curious that your average servitor has a better save than your average Skitari these days. They get the heavy weapons baked into their cost, so I suppose you're either taking two multi melters or two plasma cannons, and you could have them attached to a Skitari squad alongside a Tech Priest Engine Seer and could allow you a bit more of a bulky unit with a few more bullet catchers, I suppose. Still, though, for what they do, they do seem pretty overcosted. I don't think there's maybe quite as much use case for them as there is with Space Marines, where they could tank really big last cannon hits to save big pricey Marines. Moving on, let's talk about the Abmech vehicle units. And first up, we have everyone's favourite chunky 80s sci fi robots, the Castellans. Two to four models in the unit at 215 points for two of them, or 430 for four. The data smith that you can fill with them is really quite cheap at just 35 points, though you don't have to take one. Some people prefer not to due to the keywords. For basically just over 100 points, they are fairly tough. Toughness 9, a 2 plus save, 7 wounds and a 5 plus invulnerable save. Plus they've got the option to bounce mortal wounds against ranged attacks. If you're making a modified saving throw of a 6, the attacking unit suffers one mortal wound after it's finished making its attacks. Previously I think this one had to be invulnerable saves as opposed to just any saves. It does mean that in theory a whole load of small arms attacking a Castellan robot are likely to do a lot more damage to the unit that's firing compared with the robot itself. I feel like that's a bit of a weird thing in game, particularly if the unit could be really quite a long way away from the robot and somehow balancing their bullets back over a great big distance. Weapons wise it gets either the Incending Combustor or the Heavy Phosphor Blaster as the top gun. They're both the same profile with Strength 6, AP-1 and Damage 1 ignoring cover. The difference is that you get less hits with the Heavy Phosphor Blaster but much bigger range or auto hits with the Incendine Combustor but only 12 inch range. Otherwise I feel like the Daka Castellans probably aren't the best way to go. That one just gives you a twin linked Castellan Phosphor Blaster. I don't think that that's worth giving up the Castellan Fist for. They are at least fairly punchy in combat with 4 attacks at strength 12, AP 2 and damage 3. If you take the 2 combat fists then it counters twin linked as well. I think I'd probably most likely go for a single phosphor blaster and a single fist, though 2 fists seems okay. Then to lead the units you've got the option of taking a cybernetica datasmith. This one's 35 points and he basically has to attach to a unit of Castellan robots otherwise he counts as destroyed during the first battle round. Means that he can't just have a random cheap character going rogue on his own should he want to. He's got the stat line of a mini tech priest, toughness 4, a 2 plus save and 3 wounds, and his buffing rule for the unit of Castellan robots is either protector protocol to give you plus 2 to the attacks of ranged weapons, conqueror protocol for plus 2 to the attacks of melee weapons, I think that one's really quite good with the Castellan fist, giving them 6 attacks each, or plus 1 to the toughness of the Castellan robots, making them up to toughness 10, which I guess could be handy enough against things like melter weapons that some armies might have quite a lot of. As before, they are a bit clunky to change between these different protocols. They stay in the protocol once it's activated, and then they need to pass a leadership test to switch to another one on the leadership of 7 plus as per either of the units. It is a bit of a depressingly high chance to fail though. I think it works out as a 42% chance that he's just going to do nothing on the turn when he tries to set the protocols the first time. So those buffs maybe aren't quite as guaranteed as they might look. Some people might not like including him in the unit as well, as he both gives them the infantry and the character keyword, there's quite a lot of guns and weapons out there that are either anti-infantry or anti-character and that could potentially make the entire unit quite a lot easier to kill. Overall with these profiles I'm still not sure they're particularly stand out but could spit out a little bit of strength 6 shooting while stomping up the boards to get into combat with those Castellan fists. Next up for the other Abmech walkers we've got the Iron Strider Ballistari. These are now just 50 points each so quite a lot cheaper than they were before. Games Workshop somehow managing to push the less than 1 point per dollar mark on this unit. Spectacularly expensive now for the points that you get in game, even more so than previously. 
For the 50 points, they can be quite interesting little cheap interference units. At least fairly tough for the cost, with toughness 7, a 3 plus save, and a 5 plus invulnerable save. Plus, they do have the smoke keyword as well, which allows them to have the minus 1 to hit from stealth and the benefit of cover as well if they didn't already have it. In their new incarnation in 10th edition, though, their damage output's gone down quite a bit. They used to fire with twice the shots, but now they're twin linked instead. Plus, they also hit on 4 pluses rather than 3 pluses, like the rest of the Adeptus Mechanicus. I guess the Cognis keyword on their weapons as well gives them sustained hits 1, so there is at least a small chance for some exploding 6s and getting some bigger damage there if you get lucky. I still think for the overall profile, it's probably better off with the last cannons than the auto cannons. They are significantly better against most vehicles, anything from a Rhino to a Land Raider. Pretty similar against heavy infantry like Space Marines, so it's only really quite light infantry that the auto cannons are going to do better against. Their special rule is to fall back, shoot and charge, which I guess is handy if they get tagged. You're not going to be able to pin them down quite so easily. And they do get that data tether, so if you use a stratagem on them, you get a command point back on a 5+. plus. Overall, still not really great damage output, but okay speeds, toughness and expendability for just 50 points. It could be interesting enough to throw towards midfield objectives and give your opponent something both fairly durable and quite expendable to kill, while chipping into a little bit of anti-tank fire. The alternative for them are the Sindonian Dragoons, 1-3 to three models in these squads, for 75 points, 150 or 225. Quite significantly more expensive than the Iron Strider now, despite needing to get into combat to deal their damage quite a bit of the time. They do get the Stealth keyword built in, so they're minus 1 to hit, so are a bit more durable at range than the Iron Striders. And they have the same special rule, allowing them to fall back, shoot and charge, so they could do interesting things like falling back and charging something different. The sniper option for the unit is still kind of bad, the Radium Jezel is still just a single shot hitting on a 4, a strength 5, AP minus 2 and damage 3. Nowhere near good enough to pass up the Taser Lance for, unfortunately. I would have hoped that they might have given it a bit of a buff in this era of free war gear, as it's never going to be the better choice at this point's cost. If you do take the Taser Lance though, which seems like the better option, you now have 4 attacks hitting on a 4+, plus, a strength 7, AP minus 2 and damage 2. It's got the Lance keyword for a plus 1 to wound on the charge, Anti-Walker 2 plus, and Sustained Hits 2 to give you some big damage if you get lucky and roll some 6s. I think a unit of 3 of them is still at least fairly decent damage output here. Could be a solid threat to the majority of units that they're charging against, but for the points cost they aren't really quite as durable compared with the Iron Striders, even with Stealth. The defensive profile I think is just not quite as interesting for that cost compared with the Iron Striders down at 50. Next up, we've got the Honored Dune Crawler. This one's 140 points and is basically one of the mainline Admech battle tanks alongside the Scorpius Disintegrator. This one's now really quite significantly cheaper compared with its rival. Again, this one maybe feels like it's skewing a bit more towards durability compared with damage. It's got Toughness 10, a 2 plus save, which is quite nice with cover being fairly easy to get these days, 11 wounds, and really quite a big meaty 4 plus invulnerable save, so it's got a good chance to bounce dedicated anti tank fire. For the weapons, I feel like you're probably going to be weighing up between the Icarus Array or the Neutron Laser and Stubber. The Icarus Array between the actual array itself plus the missile launcher just seems to outweigh the Eradication Beamer or the Heavy Phosphor Blaster. I'm really unsure what they were thinking about with the Onager Phosphor Blaster. It does appear to be basically a flat worse version of the Icarus Array. Fewer shots, no twin linked, and lower strength just seems all around worse for no good reason. The Icarus Array gives you a bunch of spam strength 8 damage 2 shots plus one more powerful missile launcher that all have anti-fly keywords, so they're perhaps particularly good if you've got lots of flyers in the meta. Or you could take the Neutron Laser for a bit more focused anti-tank, two shots at a big strength 16, AP minus 4 and damage D6 plus 1. It gets the heavy keyword all the time, so she'll be hitting on 3s, and also has the Blast keyword interestingly despite not having a random amount of attacks. That could be useful enough against heavy infantry, and you also get a bonus stubber built in with that one. You then either get the choice of taking a smoke launchers or a data tether. Both of those seem kind of fine. I guess it's not inconceivable you might want to use stratagems on it for the data tether. Things like returning fire seem like quite a good choice for this one. Finally, its special rule gets to help out a little bit with terrain. You can crawl over things that are less than 4 inches in height for terrain pieces. Overall, I'd say it seems usable enough. I can't help but think, though, that a few people might be more interested in the Ferromite Scorpius Disintegrator as a rival. I would say that the Onager holds up fairly well and does add a bit of much-needed anti-tank to the army. Speaking of the Scorpius, for 195 points, you can pick up the Admech Hover Tank. A little bit faster than the Onager Dune Crawler, but a little bit less durable. It does get an extra wound and still has the 2 plus save, but doesn't have the 4 plus invulnerable save, so the most serious anti-tank weapons will be a little bit more of a threat to this guy. 
It's definitely a bit less easier to kill per point in any case, as it costs quite a lot more. These things do seem to have been making their way into competitive lists a bit, and out of the two primary guns, the Ferromite Cannon seems to be taken more often. Three shots at Strength 12, AP3 and Damage D6 is fairly solid usable anti-armor shots, plus it gets its Disruptor Missile Launcher at 36 inches. Three shots at Strength 9, AP-2 and Damage D6, but with twin links to help it punch up against heavier stuff. Between all that, you'll get a fair amount of anti-tank wounds on an enemy target, it should chip away against vehicles over the course of the game. I say the Belaros is usable, that one's 2d6 attacks with indirect fire at strength 7, AP-2 and damage 1. Still only really going to be all that good for chipping away against a few light infantry hiding on objectives and things, but that is handy. The Scorpius' special rule is a plus 1 to hit for monsters and vehicles with the Ferromite Cannon, or plus 1 to hit against infantry for the Belaros. You could maybe pair one with the Tech Priest Engines here, who can give one repairs and a 4 plus and vulnerable save. The transport version of the Scorpius is the Scorpius Dune Rider. This one's 80 points, so really quite a lot cheaper. It's quite a lot easier to kill though, with Toughness 9, a 3 plus save, and 11 wounds, so a bit less durable by all metrics with its open top. The Dune Rider has a transport capacity of 12, so it could take, say, a Skitari squad, plus an attached character maybe. It can't transport jump infantry or cataphrons. Unlike a few of the other tanks and vehicles, this one gets a consolidated heavy stubber array profile, basically the equivalent of three different heavy stubbers all linked together, nine attacks out to 36 inches, or 18 attacks within 18 inches, or with sustained hits one for the Cognis rule. I think for its price and what it does, it seems to do its job fairly well. It's fairly tough for the 80 points, got a good move with 12 inches and a good transport capacity, should be okay to get things like Electro Priests, Ross Stalkers or Skitari Vanguard where they need to be on midfield objectives perhaps. I feel like there's no real major issues with this, particularly as it can chip in with actually a fairly strong amount of anti-infantry stubber fire. I feel like most of the transported units it can take though could afford to drop a point or two. Finally for the Admech vehicles we've got the Archaeopters, three different flavours with the Bomber Fuselav, the Gunship Stratoraptor and the Transport Transvector. The Fuselav is 160 points, and they're all very roughly the same points cost at the moment. Toughness 9, a 3 plus save and 10 wounds, a little bit easier to kill compared with the Scorpius Dune Rider, and this thing attacks with both bombs and its Heavy Stubber array. The Heavy Stubbers still seem pretty good for farming out, 18 shots against infantry within 18 inch range, and then for its bombing ability with the Bomb Rack, you roll 66 for a unit that you've moved across, and then for each 3 plus they suffer a mortal wound. Unlike a few bombers in the game, at least it gets a hover mode so it can start on the board, rather than having to wait to turn up on turn 2 and then not be able to bomb anything till turn 3, so it is a bit better than that, but 20 inch movement might mean that it struggles to get to enemy units to drop the bombs on them. I think due to that it maybe feels a bit on the questionable side, at least a reasonable chance that it will just fly its way towards the enemy, not be able to reach the most important stuff, and then present itself as a pretty tempting target just to get shot down, as it's not really all that tough for the cost. Like the Onager, the Archaeopters all have the choice between choosing a chaff launcher for the smoke keyword, or the command uplink for a chance to farm command points. The Stratoraptor is a little bit more expensive at 165 points, it's got a similar defensive profile and the flyer rules, There'd be a little bit more credibility to starting this one off the board if you really wanted to. At least it's got range damage outputs that it could use on the turn that it came in. For its armaments, it's got one twin-linked LAS cannon, so basically a standard one similar to what you get on the Iron Striders. Two heavy phosphor blasters with strength 6, AP 1 and damage 1 and 6 shots total. And then two Cognis heavy stubbers as well with the rapid fire 3. It gets a plus 1 to hit against non-fly targets, which I guess isn't nothing, but still not super exciting in my opinion. I can't help but think that if you're going to take this, you might just be better off taking three Iron Strider Ballastari with the Twin Links last cannons. It maybe doesn't have quite the same movement that this thing does, but they're quite a lot tougher, and I feel like their damage output is arguably better. Finally, the Archaeopter Transvector is 155 points. This thing's generally struggled rules-wise a fair bit previously in the game. At least this time, they appear to have given it a reasonable transport capacity of 11 rather than the near-useless 6 that it had before, meaning that you couldn't really ever transport enough models in it to actually make it worthwhile. Despite that though, I think that this thing is still going to struggle. You're basically buying it in as a massive premium for a 20 inch move and then dropping a unit down, which I think is worth quite a lot, but 155 points is really quite a big ask, when that's 75 points more than a Dune Rider, which can do a very similar job, and also actually be tougher as well compared with this plane. The other rule that this guy has is the aerial deployment rule, which allows it to start in reserve. 
And its big advantage is that it gets to deep strike turn 1 if it wants to, so it could have a first turn drop. Unlike something like a drop pod though, it's got no rule to allow you to get your unit out after you've come in from reserve, so the rule is a bit rubbish really I think. You're probably better off just starting it on the board, having that big 20 inch movement, and then at least the unit can actually threaten to get out and do some damage turn 1. Overall I think it could be interesting as an alternative to the Dune Rider if it costs significantly less than it does, but I think there's no way it's worth a 75 point premium at the moment. Finally we get on to the Adeptus Mechanicus characters, and first up we have the big man Belisarius Core himself, 185 points, and must be Warlord if he is taken. Core seems to be at least a fairly popular choice in Admet competitive lists these days, quite nice to see him usable again after being a bit underwhelming for most of 9th. The way he functions is that he's a lone operative if he's within 3 inches of any other Mechanicus models, so can't be shot directly. And for his personal stats he's fairly tanky with a big toughness 8, 2 plus save and 4 plus invulnerable save, he's going to be near immune to small arms with that kind of profile. And his shooting and combat stats have got a bit more dangerous as well. His solar atomizer is genuinely somewhat concerning to enemy tanks with his Melto D3. And his combat stats have gained a bunch of extra attacks compared with 9th. But he also backs that up with around about 11 anti-infantry attacks on top of that between his Arc Scourge and Mechadendrite Hive. I think his base stats make up quite a lot of his worth given that he's sort of annoying to deal with with lone operative in the first place but then he also has a general buff for nearby Mechanicus units. He chooses his Canticles of the Omnissiah in your command phase, and generally you'd want to go for either re-roll hit rolls of 1, or an aura of stealth for minus 1 to hit for enemy units. Both of those seem really quite good to me, depends on whether you want to just absolutely capitalise on damage output during your own turn, or choose stealth as the option, particularly if you think that you're going to get hit back hard by a bunch of enemy guns, and particularly ones that are hitting on 4s or something. There's also a reroll battle shot one if you'd like, though I think that it's weaker than the other two. Overall, I think he's fairly solid, fairly chunky ranged and melee stats, and one useful buff to have in the centre of your army each turn. Otherwise, for the four other flavours of Tech Priest, first up we have the Tech Priest Dominus, 75 points, and he can lead either flavour of the Electro Priest, Catron Breaches or Destroyers, or the Skitari Rangers and Vanguard, but not things like Rust Stalkers it would seem. For his own defensive stats, his toughness 4 has a 2 plus save and a 5 plus invulnerable, and contributes to his squad with a little bit of mid-range shooting, either an eradication array for a bunch of strength 6, AP 2 and damage 2 shooting, or a Volkite blaster with a bunch of strength 5 with devastating wounds and 2 damage. As mentioned, I feel like that Omni Sterilizer relic could be very interesting with the Volkite blaster, as it gets up to 6 shots and give it anti-infantry 2 plus, so you could be farming out a whole bunch of mortal wounds and deleting entire squads of enemies if the stars align. In combat he gets a few attacks at strength 6, AB2 and damage 2, so okay against things like space marines, plus he's got a 4 plus chance to deal d6 mortal wounds to a vehicle with a data spike too. The main buff that the Dominus brings his unit is a 5 plus feel no pain type save, definitely a handy toughness boost for whatever unit he's in, but it seems by far the best value on the Cataphrons. They don't have a feel no pain already, and they've already got big chunky tanky defensive stats. The feel no pain is just a lot more likely to be useful on them, as opposed to the Skitari or buffing the Electro Priest up to a 4 plus. Overall I think he looks really quite solid leading up some Breachers or Destroyers, could be a very interesting choice for most of the rest of the enhancements as well. The Tech Priest Manipulus is 60 points, and he's got the same choice of units that he can attach to. His stat line's fairly similar, getting a little bit less AP in melee, and having a different choice of ranged weapons. He's got the Magna Rail Lance for single shot at strength 7, AP 2 and damage 3, or the Transonic Cannon for a bunch of auto hits at strength 4 and damage 2, but with devastating wounds. Again, not really huge on its own, but if you give either of those the Omni Sterilizer, it could be interesting. Either 4 shots out of the Magna Rail Lance with anti-infantry, or D6 plus 3 out of the Transonic, and devastating wounds and anti-infantry combining for a whole bunch of mortals. The buff that he gives to his unit is Lethal Hits, which is quite nice for any ranged unit really, particularly when a lot of the time they might be hitting on a 4+, plus, and that's to be a third of the hits that you get hits with. Seems good for just about any of them punching up against tougher targets, perhaps particularly monsters which you can't auto-wound with arc weaponry. In addition to that, once per game he gets a 4 plus invulnerable save for his unit, though it does need to be declared at the start of the phase, so you do need to correctly predict the turn in which your opponent's going to be shooting the unit, as when they start shooting it is a bit too late. Again, I think that he looks really quite interesting, maybe a better choice for a backfield unit that's a little bit safer compared with the one that the Dominus is going on. I guess the Dominus might be a bit better going up on a big aggressive unit that's pushing into the midfield, maybe something like Breachers moving there, and he could be good for destroyers in the back. 
Next up, we've got the Tech Priest Engine Seer, the junior apprentice to the other two, I guess. 45 points and leads the same squads, but can also take the choice of servitors as well. This guy can also choose to hang out with vehicles as well. He gets the lone operative keyword if he starts within three inches of a vehicle, and that's often where he'd just want to be anyway. Sat next to one of them and giving one vehicle a 4 plus invulnerable save and healing d3 lost wounds a turn. Overall, he seems best paired with a Scorpius Disintegrator there. That's really quite a big valuable tank that could use the 4 plus invulnerable plus also healed wounds. That one looks like the single best choice for him. I suppose early in the game you could perhaps throw the 4 plus invulnerable onto a Dune Rider or an Archaeopter moving up the board, give them that and off they go, and then switch to buffing, say, a Disintegrator later in the game. For a 45 point character as well, his combat really isn't too bad. A strength 6, AP 2, and damage 2. Could easily kill a Space Marine or so, which isn't too bad for a cheap support character. Plus he gets one of the rules that's kind of similar to Space Marine Tech Marines. If a Mechanicus vehicle is killed within 12 inches of him, then for the rest of the game he gets 6 attacks on his Omniscient Axe, plus the Servo Arm, giving him a fairly decent damage output in close combat. Could easily be killing multiple medium infantry models there. Always good to have something to do if the thing that you're buffing gets destroyed, I suppose. Overall, for 45 points, I think he seems pretty usable. Lastly for the Tech Priest, we've got the Techno Archaeologist, 45 points, and again he can attach to the other standard ones, minus the Servitors. He shoots with an Archaeotech pistol at range, and gets a Servo Arc Claw in melee, essentially a Power Fist with Strength 8, AP 2 and Damage 2, and Anti-Vehicle and Devastating Wounds. This guy is basically your Objective Support Specialist, a bit of a nice to have for units that are moving on to objectives and trying to hold them against the enemy. He gives them plus 1 Objective Control, and also it means that he denies enemy reserves to within 12 inches of him, and that could be really quite a big problem for certain armies that might want to try and deep strike and then charge you, it's going to be harder on the point that he's holding. Overall he seems okay, and he could perhaps use him to bear one of the warlord traits to buff a unit I suppose. He is a fair bit cheaper compared with the Manipulus and the Dominus, I think it's kind of hard to pass up those lethal hits or the big feel no pain type save. Finally we've got the Skitari Marshal for 45 points, he can only lead Skitari Rangers and Vanguard, not fast enough to keep up with the Sicarians, I suppose. He's quite a cheap support character with just 3 wounds, a 4 plus save and a 5 plus invulnerable. He can chip in with a tiny bit of his own damage, with an Architect pistol at range, and a control stave for a little bit of strength 6 and AP minus 1 combat if the unit that he's leading gets locked up. His boost is called Control Edict, which means that if he's attached to a unit then you get to just re-roll the hit roll whenever you make an attack. Really quite a powerful damage boost, though at the same time he is only locked to leading either Rangers and Vanguard, which makes him just perhaps a little bit more of a questionable buy-in. He might not get you significantly ahead compared with just buying in more units and more bodies that have more defence as well. Maybe it could be kind of interesting for a squad mounted in a Dune Rider where space is at a premium, and you're going to pretty much guarantee that they get to deliver at least one full round of damage dealing. He could be an option for a bit of support as well to bear that warlord trait that allows him to put other Skitari units in the different Doctrina as well. That could be quite a nice one to have in the centre of your Skitari force. Finally, he also offers a little bit of stratagem support as well. You can use stratagems on the unit even if you're battle shocked, and you can also use stratagems on the unit even if you've used them elsewhere in the same phase. Both of those could be handy, I suppose. Maybe returning fire with as a unit could be useful, particularly seeing as he allows you to re-roll the hit roll. Overall, I think he's okay for 45 points. He would have been an awful lot more exciting, though, if he could still take these Katari units and units of 20. I could still see him being useful enough, though, particularly in squads and Dune Riders. So anyway, with characters discussed, that just about brings us to the end of our look at the Adeptus Mechanicus in Warhammer 40k 10th edition, at least with the rules from the Index as they stand. I feel like quite a lot of the discussion around these guys at the moment has been talking about big blocks of breaches with character support, I do feel like both the characters and the Catron data sheets are kind of sturdy, and they do perhaps look like the best focal point for buffs. I'll probably back that up with at least some of those Skitari troops, seeing as they allow the Catron breaches to re-roll hits, plus can get a bit more objective control onto points and things. Maybe a Scorpius Disintegrator or two in the backfield, putting out a bit of anti-tank fire. And then the Admech do feel kind of spoilt for choice for little chaff units to skirmish with enemy infantry on midfield objectives, they do have an absolute ton of choice for those between Ross Stalkers, the Taraxi, the Cerberus, and the Electro Priests. I feel like you probably want some of those for the utility, but not to go too heavy on them. At the moment, they certainly feel like an army that's going to be a bit of an uphill struggle against some of the stronger factions in the game in particular. Hopefully Games Workshop managed to give them a bit of a boost in the future. In theory, the next balance update shouldn't be massively, massively long away. I think they talked about some points cost updates, probably in September or October.
Let me know your thoughts on Admech at the moment though, which units are looking to stand out for you and which are giving you good results on the tabletop right now, and which units do you think are most in dire need of help. Look forward to hearing your thoughts down in the comments. If you've enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, or certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and that's how I can keep quite so many videos coming quite as regularly as I do. Making all the content does take a fair amount of time and effort, and if you are enjoying then any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages as well, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.